Michael Crichton has sold more than 100 million copies of his books. He was at one time the owner of the number one bestseller, the number one television show, and the number one movie in the country. He went to Harvard as a medical student, always wanting to write. Since then, he has turned writing into gold. His newest book is called Michael Crichton Timeline. And once again, I'm pleased to have him on this program to talk about the book and so many other things uh, that are part of his world. I'm pleased to have him back. Welcome back. Thank you. It's good to see you. Uh, you now are a New Yorker, too, in a That's sense. Right. You're living upstate. That That's goes right. well. Excellent. I you like know? it, yeah. You moved here primarily because you wanted your daughter to have access to a different kind of school system? That's right. I mean, I, I, I'm an Easterner. And, yeah, uh, Roslyn, Long Island, as I remember. Right, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I still think that uh, Eastern education has a different quality. Yeah, that's a lot. company town out there primarily, isn't it? Los Angeles. Los Angeles, it is, yeah. yeah. Oh, sure. They even call it the company town. Yeah. <laughs> it's some company. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you are, I was thinking about all the things you do and all of your interest in history and science. But, but in the end, when push comes to shove, you know, as they say in that often quoted cliche, you are a storyteller. I think that's right, yeah. That's what you do? Yes. That's what I like to do. Where does that come from? You know, I don't know, because my daughter has it too, and... Uh, it started at an early age. I mean, when I when I would tell her fairy tales, she'd she'd stop me and go, "No, Dad, he doesn't come out of the warehouse. He, that he stays in there until the giant leaves or something." And I think, wait a minute, you know, yeah. you're editing grams. I mean, but so there's some kind of an impulse about what what makes a, a suitable story and what's right, and, and I think there may also be. Um, it sounds funny, but there may also be some kind of um, sadistic impulse in there too. Sadistic. Yeah, I mean, there's all kind. The the <clears throat> what you're really doing in a narrative is you're is you're paying out information bit by bit, which also means that you're holding it back. Mm -hmm. You know, and you're trying to make people worried about something. You know how it's going to turn out, but you want the reader to to have this feeling intermediately. And 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 in that kind of manipulation, which I think is very pleasurable to experience if it's done well, there's something like. Sadism. I mean, that's what Hitchcock was accused of, too. Yeah, I know. I know. Do you like the isolated quality of writing? Well, <clears throat> usually when I'm writing, I wish I weren't. And when I'm working on a movie, I wish I was writing. <laughs> <laughs> so it's some way to be perpetually dissatisfied, I think. But yes, the answer is I, I do. Why, it's been a long time since you directed. Yeah. Why haven't you directed more? Westworld was the last thing I remember. Was it something after that? There, there were things after that, yeah. but but um, I think primarily what's happened is that this has been a good writing time for me. The nineties. Yeah, and so that every time I think about directing something or writing something else, I think, well, I'll keep writing. I mean, it's it's that sort of moment by moment decision. We've talked about this before, but everybody's curious about this. How is it you have this uncanny sense? of choosing a serious subject uh, that fascinates us. This having to be physics and going back uh, to a previous time, quantum teletransportation, teletransportation, mm -hmm. which is what? What is that? Quantum teleportation? Yeah. Yeah, it's, a, <clears throat> it's very interesting. It's something that has just been demonstrated or just last year in several laboratories around the world, and it's <clears throat> it's ref it's t talked about as if it were beaming me up, Scotty. It's not yeah. really exactly. It's it's a transfer of a certain kind of information from one photon to another. Is what they're doing, but it implies instantaneous transportation of in information across distances that are doesn't matter how far across the entire universe, and. It's a very curious thing. And you have to understand how time works, don't you? And how, how speed of light works, and all of that. Well, it's, it's pushing at some of those notions. In other words, um, before quantum teleportation was demonstrated, there was a lot of thought among physicists that it might or might not actually be a, a real phenomenon. I mean, there was speculation. Now, it turns out it is real. What's real? That, that this kind of um, transfer can occur instantaneously 
with nothing in, in between. No, no carrier mechanism. Now, this book is about archaeologists mm -hmm. from Yale going back to the 1357, the 14th century, right. traveling back to rescue one of their own, mm -hmm. to bring back in 1999. That's not real. No, not as, a, not as far as I'm aware. <laughs> <laughs> but that is part of the idea of quantum physics and teleportation. Yes. That, or does it draw on that or not? It does, but, but I mean, I, I, You've taken I a literal want, imagination here. Yes, and, yeah. I mean, I don't want to say that, that quantum technology is going to lead to time travel. I don't think that's a fair thing to say. But do you believe it will? I don't know. Ah, that's even more interesting. You don't know. I mean, do you believe it's highly unlikely, or do you believe it's possible? I believe it's possible. If I had to guess, if you asked me to bet, I would bet against it. What makes you think it's even remotely possible that somebody could travel back to the 14th century? <clears throat> it's not clearly contradicted by theory. <laughs> you know, but I mean, that's really the... <laughs> You know what I mean? I mean it's, there, there are certain kinds of things that... Um, I really don't know what you mean because I know nothing oh, about physics, but go okay. ahead. I'm well, uh, if you have an accepted theory, then, then it has certain consequences that follow from that. And, and if those... Um, I mean, the simple one is it does seem to be very unlikely that you can travel faster than light. Um, and one of the issues about quantum teleportation is it seems to be nudging at that or yeah. potentially causing a problem. But in general, we believe you can't travel faster than light. So if you write a story in which someone travels faster than light, that's an impossible story, according to what we believe now. I try and stay within the boundaries of what's not understood to be impossible, even though there's dispute about it. All right, let me, let me frame this this way, because this is interesting. <laughs> you and the idea is interesting. Knowing what you did, what you did you know, in so many other books that grabbed our attention because you were on the cutting edge of what people taught me, whether it was sexual harassment and disclosure, whether it had to do with the rise of Japan and Rising Sun, uh, and so many more having especially to do with uh, dinosaurs and all that came out of that. Where did you first get the idea? When did you say, Michael, there's a book here? I don't know. Okay, but about when? What, what started the process for you? You're reading a magazine and there's a story about... No, this is odd. This, is, this was an odd one in a way because I... Uh, um, uh, for a long time I had wanted to do a time travel story. One reason is that I'm uh, attracted to the challenge of trying to write a story that will be persuasive even for a few hours on some subject that's impossible or, or mm. highly, highly unlikely. You know, all the time I was writing Jurassic Park, I kept thinking, this is, this is a dinosaur story. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. And is anybody going to go for this? Yeah, but, well, gonna... uh, but that's your commercial sense, too. I mean, this was, some would say it's a story about biogenetics, and you're saying, no, it's a dinosaur story, which shows you your instinct for what sells, as does your ability to make people keep turning the pages. Mm. That's an instinct for what sells, the way you write. You'll give me that? I, but I don't know how I do this. Okay. But you know it's there. Yes. And you but, know it's a story about dinosaurs rather than some highfalutin idea of biogenetics. That's right. That's right. I mean, that's been carried. And it, does not, it was not obvious to me when I was writing it that, that I could get away with this, that I could carry it <laughs> off. The people would say, oh, yeah. And, and, you know, the first people who read it quite by accident were um, people in uh, bioengineering fields. Yeah. And I was, I was watching them just gulp it right down, and I thought, wow, <laughs> wow. You know, we, we did it. <laughs> we got something here. Yeah. And, and another equally challenging um, kind of a story is time travel. All right, Ray Bradbury, Distant Thunder. What was that about? Is that the one about the dinosaur? Yeah, well, time travel, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he... he um, People go back to hunt a dinosaur yeah, and somebody yeah, steps right, in the butterfly. Right, right, right. So that's exactly changes, right. Changes, changes what happens in the future. Right. Um, 
There's actually a really interesting book by a physicist named Paul Nahan. I, th I don't know if I'm saying his name correctly. Right. And uh, about time machines. And one of the things he does is he summarizes all the the writing that's occurred in the past, which is, in a way, very discouraging because what you realize is that almost every kind of, all the changes have been wrong. In fact, most of them have been wrong by the 1920s. So th there isn't really any new thing to do there. If someone says to you, you're marrying thriller mm -hmm. with science fiction, you say, not so much fiction. I hope, yeah. Yes, a thriller, yes, a novel but less science fiction than you might imagine. That's always my um, intent. Or my and effort. calling card. Yeah. Yeah, because, for example, when you're talking about um, quantum physics, it's very, very difficult. And, <laughs> and I'm hardly you know, a person to really be knowledgeable. What, when I'm looking at this, it's so hard to describe it at all. I recognize that there's a certain level where the, a physicist would say, yes, that's the correct way to state it. But no one would get it at all. No, no reader would understand it. And then there's another way, which is pre pretty easy to understand, but the physicist would say, no, 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 it's completely wrong. Somewhere in the middle is a, is a way of putting this information that, that's okay to read for, for a reader, mm -hmm. and the physicist will say, well, okay. And that's what I'm trying to, that's where I'm trying to, to get this. It's some balance between what's technically accurate and, and what's understandable, if you're not in that field. All right, let's talk now about, cre you, we know at some point you got interested in this, mm. and you know you figured out a kind of storyline. Mm. You got to have characters, mm. all right? So you set this, tell me the story. Guy goes to, to France and he's doing a little There's a group of people research. doing doing um, research in France. Right. They're historical archaeologists, right. medieval archaeologists. They're excavating a site. Let me interrupt this one second before, before you pick it up. Have you always been interested in things medieval? No. So the 14th century didn't have any special appeal to you? Not when I began. Not knights and battles and knights, the Hundred Year War and all knights, that? Knights. Knights did? Knights, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Because, because knights are cliché. You know, everybody thinks yeah. they know. Johnny Knight, right? Camelot, and all yeah, that. Yeah, right. So, and, and for, table. Yes, right, round table. And I always thought, what's there? It is round. <laughs> <laughs> I always thought, what was the reality? Yeah. What was actually going on? What, what was knighthood really? And what was, I mean, all this idea of courtly love. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. I mean, well, it doesn't sound like, yeah. you know, how the world worked if you're very young and you know, young men and women. I don't think that was at such a distance. And so I would have these sort of thoughts, and, but I didn't know anything. And one of the pleasures of working on this book is that I got to find out. About all your books, you get to find out. Yeah. Right. Okay, so you've got to have characters. You've got these, these archaeologists, historical archaeologists, right. they're doing some investigations in France. Right. What happens? The company that's funding them, that's, that, that they see as a sort of um, benign patron, Right. Uh, sends a vice president over who says, you know, we really want to start reconstructing this village. And they say, no, no, we're not ready. And they say, yeah, you, we should. And, you know, you can at least build the castle wall from here to here and then over to the round tower in the woods. And one of them says, wait a minute, what, what round tower? We don't, nobody knows. This. And so they go out in the woods and start looking. And indeed, there is the remains of a round tower. And this vice president knows more about their site than they do. Yeah. And they want to know why. That's the initial impulse. So the, the leader of this group, who was a senior professor, goes back to the company headquarters, essentially vanishes. All of a sudden he's in 1357. Well, what happens is that, well, I, we shouldn't go through the whole thing. Yeah, but but I, really, I know, I'm not going to yeah. tell it away, but we've got to get it. I mean, you, can, you, you want people to be interested. He's, he's been gone for several days, and they're continuing their excavations, yeah. and they find a... Um, set of documents, and when they, from some earlier time, they've been buried, they uncover them, and when they open them up and look at them, there's a letter in the professor's handwriting that says, help me. So the race is on. The we now got a thriller, on, yeah. we got, and we're going to have our fabulous Yale 
graduate students mm -hmm. in battle mm -hmm. with all the knights they find in 1357, mm -hmm. who, are, who are our bad guys. Right. So we've got our good guys from Yaley's, our Yaley's and our bad guys. We've got a corporate billionaire who's sort of behind some of this, right? Mm -hmm. Sounds a little like Jurassic Park. It certainly bothered me when I did it. Um, and I finally concluded that there isn't another form. I mean, in other words, if you, if you abstract the form enough, then everything looks like everything. You know, Bambi looks like the life of Hitler. I mean, somebody, yeah. so, well, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> well, it does. You know, it's a, <laughs> trouble with the father. And, you know, um, yeah, exactly, that's right. Wanted, so, Bambi wanted to be a painter. That's play right. All it's it's yeah, all thing. Yeah. <laughs> so... <laughs> Go ahead. So, uh, but I just couldn't think of another way to do it. You yeah. know, I mean, in other words, what they share in common is that these are um, technologies that are being pushed that are phenomenally expensive. And so if you're going to try and tell a story that, that in some way rationalizes them or speaks about them as if they were real, one of your problems in, in each case is how, who's going to pay for this? Mm -hmm. A stunning amount of money. Where does it come from? It's going to come from someone rich. All right. We know what you've got to do now. Okay. I mean, so where do you go do your research? Where do you find out? Why do you choose the 14th century is my first question. Okay. 1357, right? 1357. Why then? At the end of the Hundred Years' War. No, it's actually early. R earlier than yeah. the Hundred Years' War. Right. When was the Hundred Years' War? Was from what to what? 1331 to okay, so 1450 right. or 60. Right. So it's during the Hundred Years' War. Right. Right. Why then? A couple of reasons. Um, I wanted a, a period of warfare in which um, ordinary life was very chaotic. You know, uh, there was this element of civil war in all this. There's an element of, of war between France and England. Um, it's very confused. It's very bloody. Um, you not, never know what's going to happen next. So I wanted that kind of a really chaotic time. It suited that. Then there was an event that I thought was, I, I couldn't get out of my mind, which was in 1356, the year before, at the Battle of Poitiers, which the English won against the French. The, the English captured the French king and took him back to England, where he was ransomed um, for an enormous amount of money. And, but this notion that your king could be captured by the enemy and then, of course, treated as a, in this courtly fashion as, yeah, but also, in, you know... Uh, welcomed with all the ceremony, you know, um, because the nobility is really cuts across all these national boundaries. Um, I couldn't stop thinking about this, this notion that the king of a country was gone and what that would mean to the, to the remnants of that place, which is already um, uh, not yet a nation state. I mean, England at this time was pretty much, of a, pretty much England, mm -hmm. but France was not France. Well, you've pointed out, and I've seen you say this, that, that this is an interesting time because it's sort of a kind of enlightened period. This is the time that Oxford and Cambridge were sort of, the seeds were planted. That's right. Yes. This was the time that nation states were being formed. Right. So a lot of interesting things are happening. It's not so far back that you can't find interesting things that are taking place. Right. And it's also the time of the, almost the very, not the moment, but the immediate period of the decline of, of knights. Because the English longbowmen have become supreme over everything else, and the and mounted shot cavalry, which is really the justification of all the knights, I mean these great yeah. charging men on horseback with lances, um, doesn't work anymore. I mean the, the French still do it. The English dismount their knights to fight, but the French still charge and they're just slaughtered. It's not a smart thing to do. There's rain of arrows. Yeah, these guys can shoot twenty arrows a minute. 20, 20 arrows a minute. I mean, it's, and they can shoot them 200 yards and be accurate. And it's, it's, so it's over for the guys on the horses. It's over. <laughs> it's right. If they don't die, the horses do. And yeah, they, exactly. Yeah. Uh, I mean, did you fancy yourself as being a knight? No. Never thought about that. No, I didn't have that. Didn't have that. Ed. No, because when you're doing something like this, you're going to, you're going to identify with the um, contemporary people. Right. You know, some might say, well, boy, how do contemporary people who are academicians and 
no put down of academicians or archaeologists. Mm. They're all of a sudden they're going to be transported back and they're going to be going hand to hand with all these bad guys who are inhabitants of mm. the 14th century. How can they do it? How can they do it? Well, you better justify it before you start. <laughs> <laughs> and you better, exactly. That's right. You know? Yeah. So that's part of the novelist's challenge. Right. Well, there's a, fortunately for me, there's this um, area which is called variously, you know, but one thing you call it is experimental archaeology, yeah. in which people try and recreate conditions of living in order to understand mm. what it must have been like. So there are, one of the characters is one of these people who's really interested in learning how to use a broadsword and fight in a joust and is, is acquiring all these skills in his capacity as a historian, but it turns out to be useful. Here comes one aspect that's sort of interesting to me. You, you think about historical novels, you mm. think about Tolstoy mm. and War and Peace, mm. you think about Victor Hugo, you mm. think about so many historical novelists. They, the argument could be made, were essentially interested in character and, and character and, and love and passion and relationships and all that. It just so happened they put it in a historical background. Character, dysfunctionality, was key. Mm. You seem to be less interested in character. Tell me if I'm right or wrong. That's true. And more interested in science events, some big idea. Yes. Uh, it's also true... Of course, we're not arguing with 100 million books sold either. Well, I think, uh, you know, in a, in a very weird way, this isn't a historical novel. No, it looks... No, it is. In a sense, it looks... It, no, but it looks forward, because it's quantum teleportation, right. right? And it's also going back, though, to understand the past. Right. But, but you're telling the past through the eyes of the present, yeah. which, is, which prevents you from only residing in the past. I mean, it, it, the structure is much more behind enemy lines than it is yeah. a conventional, a conventional uh, historical novel. But the answer to your question, I think, is uh, the, the, from the beginning I've been interested in uh, people caught in circumstances. And often those circumstances don't really have that much to do with who, who they are. They are. Yeah. In the same way that people in an assembly line we now understand can't improve quality. They're, they're stuck on the assembly line. It, it, you know, if you're going to improve quality in an automobile, it has to be done from the design yeah. all the way through. So, you know, nothing's come along to make you obsessive about character. Well, Actually, I've been thinking more and more about this because, <laughs> because you know, I, well, I have very uh, yes, I odd ideas about this. I mean, I, for example, I think it is really not knowable why people do what they do. Motivation is something that can't be known, can't be comprehended. Right. And you can't ask the person either because it's very clear they will give you a sort of after the fact explanation and they will also give a different explanation to someone else. They will tailor their explanation mm -hmm. for it. You and I are mirror images of each other. Just let me be personal for you, 30 seconds. I'm more interested in what, why Michael Crichton is interested in these things than I am the things that he's interested in. Mm -hmm. I'm really interested in what motivates you, why you're interested in these things. I may not be able to determine them, but I'll make an effort. Mm -hmm. More than the science, more than the dinosaurs, more than whatever it is you find that you want to light on. It's fine with me, but I'm more interested in what it is that led you there and why you were go what are you going through and what motivates you and all of that stuff. It is different than you. Yeah, and I'm telling you sort of stories about that. Yeah, right. Because I don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no. Where do I get my ideas? I call an 800 number. No, I mean, you, I don't, have, you don't know. You don't know. I don't know. Where do they come from? You read a lot? Mm-hmm. A lot. A lot. Historical things or popular press or what? Actually, a lot of academic press. Really? Yeah. How I do you mean, access it? Um, uh, usually through other kinds of journals. For example, um, my primary interest in the New York Review of Books is the ads. 
<laughs> and I just go through and circle all these books. You know? It's just great. <laughs> and I'll order all these different books. I mean, if it looks like an interesting title, I'll get it because it's a, you know, and 10% and of the time it's really interesting. 10% of the time it's ridiculous. And then the rest of the time it's sort of in the middle. <laughs> you don't think much of the internet. No. You think what? Bad information. Well, that's one thing, and it's also the home shopping channel. Let's face it. I mean, uh, um, <laughs> be you know, well, it is. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, well, the one thing that I really do like about it is that is that in the course of my day, I don't feel that I really see enough ads. So now I can get online, you know, <laughs> looking for well, you've got your information, little, and little I have these things there now, and you can have them. Hmm. Doesn't have any ads though. I know, but maybe if people know about it, they can get into you real quick. You know, they can send. I assume you have a place where people can. You know. But you know, the reason I started the web page was to handle all the misinformation that was coming about you. Yeah, from all over the place. Like what? The cancer. Was there was a story you had cancer. Mm -hmm. My mother called up in tears. Oh my God! People were my age said, Michael. Everything all right? I said, I have no idea. I said, what are you talking about? Well, there's this report. And it was on these various websites. Price of freedom. Price of an open system. Yeah. Price of no editorial. That's what it is. No editorial. And right. I mean, no editor. Is yeah. Right. yeah. And I think, that, I think that we are going to learn. I mean, to me, we're in the greatest era of snake oil salesman and baloney in the history of mankind. You know, P.T. Barnum would, is rolling over in his grave not to be here now when there's so many suckers and you can get them, you know, instantly on the internet. Yeah, um, yeah there's, I mean, I think we're not clear that edited information is the only, is really information. Everything unedited is data or it's gossip. Yeah. And anything, oh, yeah. and they have nobody has time to check it out. Nobody has time to, to as you say, edit. Or... You well, also, I mean, you're not thrilled about all the pornography on the internet either. Who is? You know, I mean, I have a ten year old now who's logging on, and um, in the, you know, just just seeing the kinds of things that my assistant runs into when I ask her to get this or that piece of information, you know, suddenly up pops a, a, a picture that we can't even describe here. I was going to go. Um, I had in mind to go talk to a group of uh, computer manufacturers because, uh, you know, they're all very much into, you know, First Amendment, First Amendment, and, and, and I am as well. But uh, I was, what I was going to do was give a speech and then just pop up these images continuously that I've come across in the Internet, you know, da, 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 because it is a genuine problem. Yeah. See, know? I mean, here's the thing, and they are probably like me. I have no idea what you're talking about. Mm. You know, because I just I'm just not out there. Not You're because not I'm any less interested in anything like that than anyone else is. It's just that you know, because of the schedule and other things. I mean, I don't have any idea what you're talking about. That's up there. I, mean, I know that pornography, and I hear about th stuff that's going on, but I don't really haven't seen it. And I suspect I'd be shocked if you pop those images up. I bet you it would be. Yeah, but yeah. It, you know, it's shocked that it's there. Yeah, I mean, I. I in this way, I mean, I'm really surprised that, that, that you know, for example, we can make voluntary agreements to, to keep, to keep uh, liquor and cigarette advertising off television. And that's how we've, that's how we've gotten around the First Amendment. Um, I don't know why, for example, we don't have similar agreements about political advertising. I don't know why we don't say, take all the ads you want as long as you stand up as a candidate and say whatever you want to say. But we're not going to have all these dissolves and all these banners and all this, you know, music, and we're not going to sell people like soap. That's not good for the electorate. It's not informative. It's not when, you know, it's well, part problem, of what's the, turning people yeah. off. Part of the problem is who has access. I mean, you know, the, having to do with how much it costs and who has access to media. Right, but... And that's another First Amendment issue. But we're not going to do anything about campaign finance, that's clear. It's a bipartisan agreement. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, there's some fighting the lonely battle, you know, mm -hmm. Feingold and McCain and yeah, others. McCain, right. 
uh, pop culture today, entertainment culture, too much of it? Are we obsessed by it? Is it, is it some way doing something demeaning the soul of a country, world? You know, it's very, if I make any kind of critical comment, I'm seen as hypocritical. Yeah, but because you're benefiting from it, yeah. because you, yeah, they buy um, your books and watch your movies. I'm surprised at, you know, I was watching television the other day, I don't always see too much TV, and one character in a sitcom said to another, well, let's face it, Mom, everyone knows you're full of crap. And I was going, kind of, you know, hello, <laughs> I've been out of touch, you know. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, but you've okay. got to be in touch to write ER. I mean, ER is in part. You know, I yeah. guess uh, one of the characters is based on your life as a young medical student, right? Yeah. But and so you got to be in touch to be a. Con I mean, this you used to write a lot. You wrote how much of it? You just well, create. I actually only wrote the pilot. The pilot. That's yeah. it. Yeah. But, um, but you stay in touch. Or you not? Know, the, no, I've stopped. You know, I've stopped. You, you sold have, it. You no. You you pass it on. Okay. And in fact, it's gone. In terms of who's really running the show, it's gone. It's really into its third generation of, in that sense, owners. Because it can, you can only do it for some period yeah. of time. You got any more television shows in you? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's hard to know now because it's a sort of funny time in television. Paramount has bought Timeline. Yes. For a lot of money. Actually, well, it's a complicated deal, but no, Paramount no, is developing it. Yeah. Complicated deal in terms of, yeah. You know, Ovitz did well for you, though, I'm sure. He did. <laughs> <laughs> he did. He's good at what he does. He's good at what he does. Um, why don't you direct this? Oh, gosh. Um, this is a big directing job. So, you're not up to it? Well, it's... Here's what you do. You look at this and you say, okay, this is somewhere between one and two years out of my life. Only thinking about this. And I've already spent three years in the book. You know, I don't know that I'm the person to... So you'd rather go direct somebody else's material, other characters that you don't quite have a greatest sense about as you do this? Or you want to direct Maybe, some small or, little love story somewhere? That... Yeah, or, or at least something that I wrote as an original screenplay so that I hadn't been with it for such a long time. And I think, you know, I've wanted to do a picture with Dick Donner for a long time. Well, he's pretty good. Yeah. I mean, he's going to direct this? He's going to direct it. Uh, he so can't. I'm happy. Yeah. Well, I mean, he has a sure instinct like you. I mean, this is like Midas meets Midas. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Well, he made all the, I mean, didn't he do all the lethal weapons? Mm -hmm. Superman. Superman. I mean, he's done a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's, he's a $10 million man that must have done Didn't he? Yeah. <laughs> so he's going to direct it. He's going to direct yeah. it. Stephen turned it down accordingly with this response. I'm just, I'm into the 20th century now, and I'm not that interested in the 14th century. Yes. He also said, I am committed four pictures ahead. I don't know whether that's accurate or not, but I mean, I, I think he's got his his work schedule. Yeah, but I mean, he did a hell of a. And he, he did Jurassic Park. He did. Did it great. Did it great. Nine, but more than a billion dollars probably in the end, wasn't it? Don't know. Well, I heard saw nine twelve million. That's if you got that close, you probably. You don't, I don't know. know. I have no idea. Don't you really? No. I bet you Ovitz knows. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he does. <laughs> Are you still going, are you still in therapy? Yeah, in a way, a little bit, yeah. You get something out of it? I mean, you think it helps your creative powers? No. I think it, uh, for me, it's much more to do with mundane things. Like what? <laughs> well, I, I have a big tendency to take on too much, too many projects because I, I imagine I can do them more quickly than I can. Oh, yeah, tell me about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. So I have somebody say, my mother would say, "Boy, your eyes are bigger than your stomach." That's right. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so I got somebody who says, "You know, well, can you really do this? Because it seems like you know, you can't." And and 
That's helpful. Yeah, it is. Hmm. Is it Freudian? No. No. I've never had a Freudian. Jungian? No. Yes. I'm just, just, just a listener. Yeah. Um, I've, I've always had a lot of trouble with, with Freudian thought, and I'm having more as time goes on. Really? Well, I, I think it's becoming clear that he is the greatest novelist of the 20th century, Sigmund Freud. He is. I mean, if you define uh, the impact of a novelist as the ability to impose a fictional view of the world, their personal and fictional view of the world, and to make it real and persuasive to other people, which I suppose is a good description of Tolstoy or Dostoevsky, well, Freud beats everybody hands down. You know, he has these elaborate fantasies, libido, death wish, blah, 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 blah. It's all based on, you know, no clinical studies, um, you know, examination of eight patients in some cases. Um, nothing is double-blinded, nothing is verified, and, and off comes this entire movement. And this whole way of thinking, psychoanalytic criticism, you know, in, in academia, based on... You know, in other words, if you were to today, if you were to say, um, I have this new therapy and it's efficacious, and if it were required to be demonstrated in the same way that the FDA requires the demonstration of efficacy of a drug, it would fail without any question. It would. <laughs> then how did he get to be so... That's a very interesting question. Wittgenstein, who was uh, another Viennese and who knew him, was... Um, said in the 40s or 50s about Freud, he said, um, it's going to take a very long time to undo this. And he didn't explain why. You know, there's, there's something tremendously... That, that they would take hold and, and would somehow... Well, I think it was already taking hold. Okay. And he, he was saying it was going to be take a long, right. long time to unravel it. There's something phenomenally appealing about it. Freudian ideas, and, and, you know, I at least read those books just avidly. I mean, they're, they're tremendously exciting to read. He's a wonderful writer. Um, but I think that, for example, the notion that there's a secret about you, that there's a whole secret existence that is unconscious, you know, um, that by penetrating we can find out uh, what's really behind it, the notion that um, what happened to you very early, that this kind of seed that grows or festers or flowers or whatever it does, and that we can walk backward to that time. The idea that we can know, that we can really know why you like to be on television and, you know, you're drawn to that and... And I say I'm not drawn to it, but here I am. <laughs> you know. Well, but we no, no, that, that, yeah, that's a whole other story we've talked about. It's not so much you like to be on television, it's like to do what you're doing. And mm. it so happens that you also, you know, would like to do it in front of all the world's people. Mm. <laughs> you know, the right. idea is that however you can communicate it. I mean, if I can get them all in an arena, I would be happy to do it there. Right. It's the idea of being interested in, it is um, just more than you want to know, it is the driving curiosity about the impact of, that individuals have and what shapes them and, and, and w how they move an idea. W what we just talked about with respect to Sigmund Freud fascinates me. Because motivation does? Motivation. Oh, it's enormously fascinating. No, no, no. You're just saying, my boy, you can learn less about it than you think. You're, you're overly optimistic in terms of what we can know and understand about motivation, whether it is going back to some relationship in your childhood or something that happened to you in your childhood or whether it is, you know, choices you make. You, you know, know, it may I, be unknowable. Right. It may just be something, some, co some combination of brain chemistry and mm -hmm. something else. Mm -hmm. Or whether, in fact, our brains have weather. weather. We, have, we have gloom. We have excitement. We well, have. Well, we know that's related to chemistry. Yeah, we know but, that. But I mean, what we understand about weather is it comes and goes, and we don't attach. We don't say it's rainy today because it was rainy in 1950. We just say, well, today a combination of events occurred and it's rainy. But what do you think about all the farm, the whole pharmaceutical thing from? 
Prozac to lithium to Viagra it's, it's, to it's here. It's here. I mean, I don't I don't have any objection to it. What idea? Or what circuit? What other when you when you sort of latched lat, latched on to quantum teleportation? Mm. What was this in second place as an area of exploration? as an area of great curiosity for you, something that you might have stepped up to if this let you down. Sigmund Freud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, there's a, an element of truth there. There's no, no, an element of truth there, absolutely, isn't Absolutely, yeah. No, he's waiting in the wings. Be, because um, the, 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 all the things that you were talking about before are having to do with character. I mean, I have these ideas that you can't know these things, or that, or that a lot of uh, 20th century fiction has, has elaborated this internal me- psychic landscape which characters are, are thought to move through and have these feelings for these reasons. And um, I, I don't believe any of it. I mean, I'm, I'm in that sort of causative sense much closer to Hemingway who says, you know, the rain fell, it was cold. It was, the leaves were blowing. I had a cup of coffee. I mean, with nothing that connects and says this was because of that. This but is, I think I have to explain that probably. I have to write something too. Well, would it, will it be a book or will it be something else? Right, it'll be, no, it'll be a book yeah. probably. I remind you. <laughs> <laughs> you did a book on Jasper John. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. I mean, so you have been known to go off and and in, investigate the lives and talents and contradictions of interesting people. Jasper Johns happens to be alive. Yes. So it would be in the course of events for you to do that. Yeah, but you know... It wouldn't be that much of a departure for you to say, you know... No, but you know, when I was working on the Johns book at a certain point, I really began to wonder whether the things that I was writing were descriptive of him or of me. (laughs) <laughs> you know, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's an odd problem. It's, it's akin to the problem of whether or not you can ever write history that's not contemporary history. Yeah. You know, can you ever describe another person and not be saying more about yourself than? Well, of course, Picasso used to say every portrait is more about the painter than the sitter. Yeah. Although I think it's probably sort of halfway in between. But yes, I think that's right. Well, Picasso said about Gertrude Stein. She said. It doesn't look like me," he said. "It will. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> and it was true. That's nice. It did. Yeah. I mean, you know, when she got over, it, it looked yeah. exactly. She came to realize it was true. Um, travel. Mm. Boy, you used to write. You wrote that wonderful thing about travel. You know, Kilimanjaro, mm-hmm. all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Don't you yearn to do that? I mean, why can't we, we just take off some time and not be so obsessive about work? You know, for me, it was initially, Charlie, it had to do with the thought that if I, if I were going to do a track of the sort that I used to do, yeah. the, about the fastest that I could do it would be five weeks. And I just didn't want to be away from home that long. Really? Yeah. I mean, it was, but now as time goes on, you know, my daughter is less interested in having me around sometimes. And so well, how, I, does that, how does that <laughs> catch you? I assume. Well, you know, yeah. adolescence is adolescence. Yeah. And, I mean, oh, and, Dad, uh, you're no longer interested. That's right. <laughs> you know, I, just, I used to love those conversations, but, you know, I'd rather be with Bill. Yeah. He's, such, so, he's so much more fun than you are. Yes, and so much more interesting, much more <laughs> hip, too. Yeah, exactly. And, and I driver, like the same music. The driver just goes, so, don't get out of the car. <laughs> <laughs> Did you? <laughs> so it's like, but so I mean, I'm seeing the possibility that I might be able to do that again. But yeah. um, oh, she, so, so when she leaves the nest, then yeah. you may be able to escape again. Mm. Yeah. But for the moment, not, not for that duration. Yeah, Anne Marie worked on one of your projects. I've forgotten which one it was. A movie called Runaway. Uh, Runaway. Yeah. yeah. Well, did she have something to do with Rising Sun or not? No. 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 Oh, we uh, we, we uh, wrote. Um, it's good for you to get this. I'm telling you. Twist, if you don't. Twist it together. <laughs> you're in trouble. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. right. That's oh, right. I'm sorry, she worked on one of I'm them, sorry. but I can't remember which one. Can you describe her contribution? Yeah, it was. Um, <laughs> no, it's, uh, okay. Yeah, I can actually. It was a lawsuit about yeah. this. Um, 
It was okay, somebody, somebody accused you of having gotten this idea from them, and you had to go to court to yeah. prove otherwise. Right. Very interesting experience. For really? Me. In yeah. what way? It's a gigantic chess game. It's, it's really kind of, I'm, I am going to write about it, but, you know, it's this kind of thing where I would say to the attorneys, well, why don't you just say this? And they say, well, if we say this and he says that, then we have to say this. Well, we don't want to say this, and then, and it's like a chess game where you're playing several moves ahead, and it's all verbal. And I, I just thought it was phenomenally interesting. Although I, well, man, this is easy. All you got to do is figure out how to set a novel in a courtroom. I'm going to do nonfiction. I'm going to, I'm oh, going to describe what happened. Yeah. Oh, you're going to describe this particular event. this case. I'm going to do it. Yeah. Yeah. How much of that is simply, you know, a little bit of getting back? Revenge. Yes. <laughs> Hey. You want to take on a novelist? It's <laughs> if you want to do this, there is that there, risk. There is yes. that risk, you uh -huh. know, yeah. or a filmmaker, whatever. Mm -hmm. you know. No, I think it's. Um, uh, I think it's to get it out of my mind, you know, to put it to rest, and um, and also because you know, there's this way where almost everybody has heard that the. Accusation was made, and many people have never heard that we won. So, yeah, exactly. You know, there's a huge article in the New York Times when the trial started, none when and it ended. When we, end, yeah, when we won it, so none. Now, you can work these things into novels, too. I mean, you know, you, you, you take the, the airframe. I mean, you took, a, you took your swipe at the media right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, back when uh, I think it wasn't so clear where so much of it was going. Yeah. Did I miss something? Has that already been made into a movie? No. Or, I didn't think so. No, we stopped it. I was it. trying to, you yeah, stopped it. Stopped it. We got what I thought was a very good script uh, by Frank Pearson and we started budgeting it and it was just phenomenally expensive. So we began to work. Uh, Joe Roth at Disney was great about it. We started trying to find ways to get, get it down to a reasonable level. We never could. You know, it's just inherently costly because of all these you have to have two major airplane events and film them have to do them great and yeah uh, yeah but it's so timely i mean look at what I mean, you, yeah, you see today look at today's are, today's headline can i tell you what today's headline is fbi may be asked to take over case of a Egypt, Egypt air crash cryptic words on tape after review of voice recorder safety board is concerned about intent of pilot mm. there's a novel right there not, would fact. not be the first time that I, I think it's at least there have been at least two other construction and everything else. But go ahead. Two other uh, crashes where they believe that the pilot was committing suicide. Really? No, I, mean, I, I believe that's the question here. No, I, I, I don't know. I haven't read that much beyond the front front page. But it, either I assume it was either that or something else. Yeah. That's very sick you to know, take that many people with you. It is difficult, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's worse than Columbine. By far. Now, does that interest you, Columbine, and all the sense of America and violence? I get very interested at the time it was, at the time that it happened, and um, b b did a lot of research about media and violence at that time because I, I've tried to limit violence in what I do. I mean, which. Eh, which really amounts to trying not to have Oh, you put people, it in the third, 14th century. Well, that's beheadings with swords, you know. I mean, it, it's, <laughs> it's... But what I mean is I tried to keep uh, handgun shootings out of what right. I do. I tried not to have that happen uh, any more than I have to. And what I found, you know, is this very unpopular thing, but it seems to be quite true, that um, the correlations are difficult or impossible. I mean, all the time that we're having these discussions about the increasing media violence and rise of video games and so on, the murder rate's dropping in this country. It's been falling for six or seven consecutive years. You know, I asked someone about that last night, and they, they, they said, they said it was, I said, why is the crime rate dropping? And this was broader than just mm -hmm. murder, but they said uh, it has a lot to do, it has a lot to do with, I mean, science and technology and how they report stuff and how they demand accountability and a lot of other stuff as well as police on the ground and all this, you know. All right. What do you think? I'm sure that's true, and I'm sure that um, 
that there's some kind of demographics involved where there's a, there are fewer juvenile males, you know, in this period. Uh, but that, but there are about to be there are about, yeah, right. there are about to be many more. Yeah. Um, but I don't think there's any question that um, um, it's unfortunate. But I mean, a lot of the increase in incarceration has had an effect, yeah. and. Um, and a lot of the police focus has had an effect. I mean, the notion of what's happened in New York where, where you're really going after petty crime and cleaning up the environment seems to have a, oh, sure. a, an effect that I think is counterintuitive. I mean, I wouldn't have thought that that was... Sends a message. Yeah. You know, if, if you're cleaning up squeegee guys, you're, you're sending a message that this is just a small example. We, if we're going to take care of this, we're going to take care of the big stuff, too. Well, I think it does more than that because I think when you're now in a cleaned up environment, you behave differently. Yeah. You know, you're... The, the behavior that might have seemed not so aberrant now seems aberrant. Yeah. I, I, it's interesting. I mean, it's not rel relative to that, but I've been frantically searching to find a place to live. I'm literally homeless now. An apartment, right? And I was talking to a friend of mine the other day who said, you know, the first thing you've got to do is you've got to find an apartment with a lot of light. You've got to find an apartment with a lot of light because I have essentially lived most of my life in the dark. I went to work at, in the dark. I sat in an office all day, and I came home, and he said, I think it had terrible, Im terrible impact mm -hmm. on me. I can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Um, here we are. <laughs> here we are in a dark studio. <laughs> what am I doing? Uh, a couple of things I want to, before we go. Does, what does it mean that, that in 1998, Forbes magazine, one of those great surveys of the richest people in entertainment, had you like eighth or ninth or something like that? Does huge wealth mean much to you, other than freedom? Uh, no. In, in sort of in the short form answer. I think Galbraith was right. He said there's a big difference between not having enough money and having enough, and there's very little difference between having enough and having more than enough. Is that right? Something like yeah. that. Yeah. I mean, but do you think, because you are in this range now, you know about how you can use it? Yes, you sure. do. Of course, you know because I mean you're you're, you're so you're such a consumer and connoisseur of ideas and and frontiers you know, that well, you know how to make a difference. Actually, I just look for situations where um, uh, funding isn't going to come from other sources. You know. Mm. Certain kinds of publications are um, having difficulty, or certain kinds of uh, educational programs need scholarships. So I'm drawn to that. This book is called Timeline. Uh, 1.5, I think, million copies. It's a Kanaf book. Michael Crichton. Um, it's another great story, and uh, it is always good to have Michael here. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Charlie. Michael Crichton for the hour. Thank you for joining us. See you tomorrow night.